more and more startups like Flipboard are telling me that their uh, scaling problems are becoming much different than they were four or five years ago. They say they're seeing growth lines that look like this rather than look like this. And that means that they need new database architectures. And today we're talking to Clustrix about their new system to help startups and help other companies scale their databases. Who are you? I'm Paul Mikesell, uh, CEO and co-founder of a company called Clustrix. Uh, Clustrix has built the first and best uh, cluster database system for internet scale applications. Uh, before Clustrix, I was co-founder of a company called Isilon Systems, uh, which EMC just bought recently for $2.25 billion. Uh, and we think we're on the same trajectory here at Clustrix. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thanks. Uh, when I've talked to uh, technologists like Mark Zuckerberg, and he, he tells me about the scaling problem that yeah. Facebook faced. I remember him telling me that uh, he was using sharding techniques yeah. and memcached to try to scale a MySQL database yep. or a series of MySQL databases out. Right? Yep. And today, our, our the growth of startups is going even faster than Facebook saw mm -hmm. in its early days. So I'm hearing this problem where the current architectures of databases are not scaling fast enough to keep up with the mm -hmm. demands. And I'm wondering what you guys are doing that's mm -hmm. different than the old way of doing it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, uh, and that is what people have been doing to date, is, is sharding with MySQL, uh, using memcached to help scale that out a little bit, although memcached is a, a, a read cache, right? If you're going to do writes, you have to do manual invalidation, and you have to manually do write through or write back, depending on your application. So. Sharding is a very painful process. It means essentially taking your database, uh, breaking it apart into a bunch of little individual databases, uh, and then having to manage all of that interaction in the application. So and if you're growing really, really fast, yeah. you, you might have to do that three times in the first week. You right? gotta, you gotta, <laughs> you got, and you have to keep doing it, and then it makes every piece of development on top of that sharded complex more painful moving forward. So something that should have been a single SQL query, uh, something familiar to just about everybody, uh, now becomes a major engineering project to figure out which database or databases to speak to from the shard, uh, from the shard groups, uh, how to put that data together, remove duplicates, do any kind of sorting you want to do. Um, it's the traditional uh, relational stuff that is now broken in this sharded world. So doing things uh, which should be simple, like a friends of friends lookup, um, is just extremely painful. Yeah. So what Clustrix is about is, is solving that problem uh, once and for all. So what we've built is a truly distributed, clustered, fault-tolerant, shared-nothing database system. It is uh, comprised of a series of individual nodes, and you just add nodes to the cluster, and the database grows. Uh, what happens is, internally, we have a cluster database engine that we wrote from scratch called Sierra. And what Sierra does is it breaks queries apart into individual query fragments, and then those query fragments are run uh, in parallel across the different nodes in the cluster. So our mantra here at Clustrix is we bring the query to the data instead of the data to the query. So this, this is a system that lives in Clustrix's mm -hmm. data centers? It, it's not something you run on a cloud infrastructure like Amazon it, it, or Rackspace Cloud? It is, is, a, it? It, is a, um, it is a product that we sell. Uh, it is uh, delivered today as a hardware appliance. Okay. So what you get from Clustrix is boxes, and as many boxes as you need. Um, none of the interesting part is in the, is in the hardware. The hardware is all about um, being able to qualify platforms and just make sure that our customers uh, know what they're getting and don't have to worry about messing around with drivers or storage infrastructure or anything like that. Um, it, it all goes to this ease of ease of use, simplicity of use idea. Yeah. So um, the only question really is uh, how many nodes do you need, right? So it, 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 for it'll scale to any size that you need to grow to. Something like a Zynga, how many nodes would they need? <laughs> um, it depends on how many databases they have today. I know, I, from what I understand about them, they have a couple hundred. So, um, uh, similarly, it would probably be a, a similar number of, of n individual nodes, but what it would mean is that their application development time would go uh, way down. It would be a lot easier to deal with. It, uh, the time it takes to add new features would go way down. Um, it's in, it's a, inherently a lot more fault tolerant. The cluster system is, uh, there are no single points of failure anywhere in the system. And then to grow is just as easy just adding more nodes. So there's never a point where you have to go back and 
change your sharding strategy or re-engineer things. Now, um, do I have to buy the nodes from you, or do I yeah, do I go to HP and buy a, or Dell? No, or it's something? all one-stop shop. Just okay. everything from Clustrix. Okay. okay. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention is you mentioned Facebook, and and um, you know they were that's a great example of somebody who has uh, been doing a lot of sharding, and that's how they got to their scale. And uh, you probably saw some recent announcements. Uh, uh, Jonathan Heiliger, who's vice president of operations for Facebook, is yep. on our technical advisory board. Um, and has been working with us to help, you know, define the product, and he's been a great, great help to us. But it, so uh, I work for Rackspace, and that this is why mm -hmm. we're here is mm -hmm. to learn about new companies yeah. and new approaches, and maybe even pull those into mm -hmm. our data centers in the future. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you would uh, um, be able to, to work with a mm -hmm. cloud vendor on? And yeah. be because yeah, the, the world yeah. is moving cloud. Let's just be yeah. be honest yeah. about that. Right. And, People want to, you know, spin up 20 servers and sure. and put an infrastructure out there. Right. Is this something that is mm -hmm. movable to a cloud infrastructure? Yeah, there are um, a couple different ways that that can happen. Uh, initially, it'd probably take the same route that we did at Isilon. So there are many cloud vendors using Isilon storage as their storage platform. Yeah. Uh, likewise, using Clustrix as their database platform um, is is something that we're working with people on and would like to do more of. So that would be a great. Um, place for us to focus on, as well as just uh, other general Rackspace uh, customers. Uh, uh, we do have some installations at Rackspace and have been working with various Rackspace uh, people. I assume so, yeah. yeah. Um, we're hearing a lot about all these NoSQL mm -hmm. movements, yeah. right? The Cassandras, yeah, the Hadoops, sure. uh, whatever. Right. How, how, how should somebody evaluate right. your, your uh, platform versus some of these other right. newer platforms? Mm -hmm. and? and what are the benefits and, and mm -hmm. cons, I guess, yeah. of, of what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the NoSQL stuff, uh, if you look at the history, the evolution of, of how things came, a lot of this was uh, to address the failure of scalability in the SQL systems. Um, so sharding, um, and in many ways NoSQL is a, re a reaction to that failure. Right? Uh, most of these folks did start on MySQL and then got to a point where it just wouldn't scale anymore. Yeah. So what, what do you do next? Um, there are certainly uh, many workloads where a NoSQL solution works great because there's no need to do anything relational, um, and it really is just a key value store, key, key value lookup kind of workload. Um, but for uh, most of the applications that we see, there's a lot more going on than just looking up values. And once you hit a, um, an application or a workload like that, you really want to have all that SQL functionality. And the reason people have been having trouble with that is because the theory was that you know SQL doesn't scale. Right? Yeah. So Clustrix has solved that. With Clustrix, SQL scales as far as you need it to. And you guys are completely compatible with MySQL? Yeah, that's and, right. And does that answer the lock-in concerns that mm -hmm. I'm sure some people are like, what? Yeah. I have to deploy on your mm -hmm. servers yeah. and be locked into your right. into your business? And I, most of the geeks I know are yeah, adverse I to that a little oh bit. Oh yeah, I completely understand that, right? As a, as a startup, um, you wouldn't want to, or any business at all, right? You wouldn't want to lock your data set into some new company's um, infrastructure or, or you know, data storage type. Um, so that does answer the, the lock-in question a lot. So we are uh, MySQL compatible. We speak the MySQL protocol uh, on the wire. We also can do, uh, we handle the MySQL replication protocols also. So both um, uh, both uh, row level and statement level replication. Yeah. So fault tolerance, replication between data centers, all of these things just just works, and you can replicate between Clustrix and a series of MySQL boxes, and vice versa if you want to, uh, as well as supporting things like the MySQL dump and all those other th all those other things. So um, it really is just take your application, which was running on MySQL, and uh, point it at Clustrix, and now you have something infinitely scalable fault tolerant and super easy to use and deploy. Yeah. How, how important is uh, fault tolerance today? I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I remember living next yeah. to Tandem Computers when they were talking yeah. about that in their, in their right. 80s. There, there, we've seen more people interested in, in scalability in the internet side of things. Um, yeah. In the more traditional Fortune 500 markets, uh, people seem to be, to be a, a lot more interested in fault tolerance, just as you said. Uh, and sort of both of those groups are interested in ease of use because that's just you know everybody's dream is to be able to just plug things in and not have to mess with it. Uh, so scalability and fault tolerance are sort of primarily you know weighted differently in those groups, but it seems like both people uh, are interested in both somewhat. Yeah. Um, 
you know, one of the one of the other things that we bring is is uh, immediate consistency. So it's 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 not the case where you have an eventual consist consistency model where you have individual um, uh, nodes trying to act as part of a sort of pseudo cluster that will eventually wind up at some answer. Right? With our system, it really does look like a true uh, acid always correct database. So there's yeah. never inconsistencies in the data. And I mention it just because I, I read a lot of blogs of folks talking about, well, I was using this, you know, pick a key value store solution. They're, yeah. they're, it's usually, you know, Mongo or Cassandra or something like that. Um, and, you know, what happened to my updates? I, I got some stuff out of sync. I'm not really sure I understand what happened, right? And yeah. so some of those eventual consistency models are, um, you know, sort of tricky to understand, difficult to work with, uh, can cause a lot of problems. Absolutely. And uh, so, you know, using a nice uh, acid solution like, like Clustrix really has uh, saved a lot of people a lot of hassle and a lot of time. Yeah. One of the other th things that we're seeing is people are putting databases around the world to mm -hmm. be close to the customer so mm -hmm. that, um, you know, people in India have a, as good mm -hmm. an experience as yep. we do here in San Francisco. That's right. How do you handle uh, mm -hmm. that world? And uh, mm -hmm. no. Yeah, absolutely. So geographic affinity uh, I I is an important property for a lot of these, uh, for all types of infrastructure, so storage uh, and, and, and structured data, structured databases. So we handle that through the MySQL replication protocols. Um, and you can do that, you know, 10 nodes in, in Paris, 10 nodes in Amsterdam, 10 in New York, 10, in, 10 on the West Coast, um, and we'll replicate between those and, and you know, wherever your data centers are at. Yeah, and so y your boxes run in, in the hosti hosting of your customers? In other words, we could be hosted at Rackspace, yeah. or you could be hosted at some other yeah, data center right. in Europe or in yep. Asia or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're we're data center agnostic. We 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 can and we are selling in in Europe uh, and all over the United States, and and you know have a lot of experience shipping boxes, you know, continentally and all that stuff. Yeah. What what's the cost uh, differential between uh, you know setting up your own MySQL mm -hmm. databases and doing it yourself and then going yeah. to the cluster support? Yeah, right. So we've done some analysis of this, and um, for a lot of these uh, sharding um, initiatives that folks have to undertake to move their application to the next level of scalability, it can take people you know uh, uh, eight to ten engineers for a number of months at times, having to rewrite large portions of the application, um, and in a cluster solution. You know, for the cost, uh, less than the cost of a you know a single headcount uh, uh, annualized, right? You can have your cluster up and running and uh, experience you know the ease of use and scalability without having to go through all that pain. Right. And there have been a number of people who we've we've saved them from having to go down that sharding road at all. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not. Um, and so what that means is that now instead of having to take all those, uh, you know. Uh, very key uh, folks in their development team and put them on this side project just to get to the next level of scalability, um, which doesn't really do anything for the customers other than keep the site up and running. Um, they can now focus on engineering more features and more competitive type stuff rather than just worrying about the next outage because of scaling. Absolutely. Um, what else should, should customers be aware of when they're deciding between these Mm -hmm. Multiple, di you know, database architectures, mm -hmm. Mongo and Cassandra, and yeah. old style MySQL, and, right. and you guys. Right. I, I guess I think the key is really um, what's the workload gonna gonna look like, and if it's anything beyond just looking up key value store stuff. If you start developing your application around uh, talking to multiple of these kinds of things, um, and uh, dealing with you know multiple rows coming back from your key value store, trying to do a bunch of logic. There, that's all development time, and um, and it sort of gets harder and harder and more and more involved as things move forward. So you know, once you see that start happening, uh, maybe take an evaluation and figure out. Well, maybe I do want to be on a SQL system because it just handles all this stuff for me, right? Uh, and for most people, that's where they started off. Um, even today, most people are starting off on a MySQL system of some sort. Yeah. Um, and there's a natural reason why why that is, right? The the language of SQL. Uh, is extremely functional and will do, you know, basically everything you need. Um, and with a lot of the different abstraction layers that are out there, um, it sort of gets easier and easier to develop on top of a platform yep. like that. So. Um, for a startup, there they probably, you know, like Flipboard had no yeah. idea what was going to hit them yeah. before because sure. you know they knew that they were going to be popular, but they had no idea what was going right. to show up. How do you in Clustrix? How do you how do you plan? Do you have to buy ten nodes? And then, you know, 
see what shows up, uh, you know, the first day, yeah. or if you're going to be on right. Oprah, see what shows up, right. and then you're right. going to have to mm -hmm. say, oh, we needed 30, or we needed 50 well, nodes. Well, right, so there are a couple different things here. So the, so we have, you know, a lot of inventory of, of nodes, and we can ship nodes, you know, at the drop of a hat if people need stuff, and it really is 30 seconds to install and add nodes to the cluster. Okay. Um, so, the, so the only, you know, sort of uh, time frame you have to worry about is how long does it take me to get a node from, from Clusterx, and we can do those things next day. Um, so um, the other thing I the other thing I will point out is that um, in terms of system degradation, as things come under load, uh, we have a lot of performance graphs that show the the cluster system as a whole. Um, when it starts to get loaded, um, will degrade in performance at a lot nicer rate than something like a MySQL system, which typically just hits a wall and then goes essentially to almost zero transactions per second. Yeah. The cluster system, you can tell what's going on a lot er a lot earlier. Uh, we have a lot more tools and a lot more information about what's actually happening on the system that is all available from within the system. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have a great support team that likes to help uh, with those kinds of things also to really help project what what's going to happen on the system and sort of how many you know how many resources you need to, to bring to that. Do you, do you have uh, uh, guidelines like if you're going to be on Oprah, you should have 20 nodes in your database uh, or, it, or something like that? Well, yeah, so that, it, that's a good point. There's a lot of this is very dependent on workload. There are yeah. some people that at, at, you know, uh, at a million users need 20 nodes and there are some people that at 200,000 users need 20 nodes and it's very workload dependent on the application. Um, so that is why we like to have our, our support teams help uh, work with people to, to plot that yeah. uh, plot that graph and see where things are going and, and at what point do you need more nodes and, and all that. Anything else that we should know about about you or your company? Or, um, or, or I, the you technology? Know, we there? have a great uh, engineering team here who loves to work with, with our customers to uh, focus on how to help them solve their problems. Uh, we always like to listen to feedback from people. Uh, we have done some things and continue to do some things to help evolve the platform in ways that um, uh, other database vendors, uh, MySQL, you know, certainly things like uh, like Oracle will never be able to do for people because they're just not focused on their customers in the way that, that we are. So uh, I think we're also a pleasure to work with as a group. Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, is there any programmatic way to turn on new, new nodes? Or do I have to actually be watching, oh, I'm running out of... Yeah. Uh, at a headroom here, and I need a few more. I'll order some more and put them in. Um, so um, we do have a whole system of um, of alerts and email notifications um, and plugins for things like like Nagios and, and Ganglia and stuff like that, where you can actually track what's going on over time. And those alerts will come to Clustrix, and we can we can see that remotely and, and help you plot that out. Yeah, um, which has been the the primary way. Um, but turning on new nodes is really just rack the thing and then, and then say add node to cluster. All right. Thank you very cool. much. All right. Thanks.